So on behalf of the Department of Physics, Scottish Church College, I welcome you all. And I request our principal, Dr. Madhumanjuri Mondor, to inaugurate our program. Thank you, Joita. Good afternoon, everyone. Respected speaker today, Professor Biman Nath, our vice principal, Dr. Shupratim Dash, Dr. Shamrat Bhattacharji, IQAC coordinator, Dr. Rajasri Khosh Barsar, Dr. Vidisha Sinha, Senator Secretary, Dr. Naran Chandra Dash, Teachers Council Secretary, Dr. Joita Choudhury, HOD Physics Department, my respected colleagues and beloved students. I welcome you all today on behalf of Scottish Church College family. Though I'm not from the physics background, but as a layman, I have tremendous interest to know about universe. And like me, I'm sure all human beings want to know about the mysterious universe where we are existing as a tiny particles. Today, Professor Nath will discuss on the impact of dust particles in the universe. This will be a very interesting session to know about the dust in the universe. We always want to clear dust from our vicinity, but the importance of dust for the existence of universe will be discussed today. The optical properties and electrostatic forces of these dust particles in space and their roles in formation of stars will be discussed. The audience are waiting eagerly to listen to you, sir. In this occasion, I would like to congratulate the Department of Physics, especially our HOD, Joita, and Dr. Shamrat Bhattacharji, IQAC coordinator, for organizing such webinars for all of us. You are helping the college to impart knowledge to our students and faculty, which is the main objective of our institution. I'm thankful to you for helping me and the institution as a whole. I wish you all the best and pray to God to bless all of us today. Thank you. Thank you, madam. I request our vice principal, sir, to say something. <clears throat> A very good afternoon. My heartiest welcome to Professor Biman Nath, today's uh, speaker, today's esteemed speaker. My dear colleagues and dear students. We know that Professor Nath today will mainly speak on the history of dust in the galaxy. Uh, as very rightly pointed out by our principal, that really all of us have a very profound uh, inquisitiveness uh, about the mysterious universe this galaxy. Uh, I do not know physics or astrophysics. I know a little bit of history only. Hence, uh, I would, uh, before anything, I would like to uh, quote a few lines from Carl Sagan, the American planetary scientist and uh, astrophysicist. Uh, I'm just quoting. Before we invented civilization, our ancestors lived mainly in the open out under the sky. Before we devised artificial lights and atmospheric pollution and modern forms of nocturnal entertainment, we watched the stars. There were practical calendar reasons, of course, but there was more to it than that. 
even today, the most jaded city dweller can be unexpectedly moved upon encountering a clear night sky studded with thousands of twinkling stars. Look again at that pale blue dot. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. That's here, that's home, that's us. Every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam." Unquote. Now, I believe surely Professor Nath today will look into the main phases of star formation, and certainly he will explain the influence of dust on star and planet formation. As a very layman, just I heard since my college days about uh, interstellar clouds of gas and dust leading ultimately to nuclear fusion reactions. Now, my very humble questions are, what is the role of chemical composition of clouds? And what types of chemicals form superstar clusters? Star formation in environments across the vast reaches of cosmic time must be significantly different from those in our own galaxy. Looking outward from our own galaxy is actually looking back in time. Star formation must have changed as the universe has been more and more aged. Now, is it correct to say that the universe was much richer in the gas needed to form stars billions of years ago than it is today? Uh, just uh, this kind of questions, I think, may come into anybody's and everybody's mind. I also believe that today we are having, we are going to have a very, very interesting and very enlightening session. So with these few words, I welcome our speaker once again, and I congratulate the physics department for organizing this kind of webinars at absolutely regular intervals. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. One. So before the lecture, let me introduce our today's speaker, Professor Biman Bihari Nath. His schooling was in Assam, and after that, he studied in Delhi University. He obtained his PhD degree in astrophysics from the University of Maryland, USA. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Max Planck Institute, Germany, then at Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune. He is working in Raman Research Institute, Bengaluru since 1997. He was also visiting scholar at Max Planck Institute, Germany and University of Oxford, England. He has worked on various aspects of diffuse matter of our universe, intergalactic matter, possibility of active galaxies and so on. Today, <clears throat> Today, he will talk about the dusty universe. Sir, all of us are eagerly waiting to hear from you. Please start. Thank you, Professor Jaita Choudhury. Thank you, uh, Principal and uh, respected Vice Principal and everyone involved in this seminars for kindly inviting me to this forum. Um, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to 
be in this forum and to talk about something related to uh, astrophysics that uh, <clears throat> so what i uh, i want to talk about so let me share the screen and then start right so i want to talk about a constituent of our galaxy and the whole universe which you may think at first sight from an astronomical point of view to be a nuisance uh, and what i have in mind is dust dust grains if the dust grains absorb light scatter light and uh, get heated in the process then re-radiate in some other wavelength and all this process create complications of our interpretations of what we see, of our observations of stars and galaxies. Uh, so in that respect, uh, it is, uh, this is why one may think that it's a nuisance. But uh, it turns out that dust plays a very crucial role uh, in the evolution of galaxies. And so, uh, because it is very important for star formation. And I would like to tell you uh, in this uh, uh, in the next uh, hour or so how uh, and why stars uh, it is difficult to form stars without dust grains, and that's why it is very important to study dust grains in order to understand how galaxies evolve and uh, and why it has become a, a very important topic of research now. So. Um, <clears throat> Let me go back to an earlier time as a flashback uh, before 20th century. Um, okay. Um, astronomers for a long time have seen, observed dark patches in the sky. And uh, like this, for example, in this picture. Um, and it's even uh, visible to us if you look at the Milky Way with a naked eye. I don't know how many of uh, you have seen the Milky Way. Uh, you may have to go to a remote place uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, with a clear sky, for example, to a mountain um, and where you can see the Milky Way. And if you, particularly if you see it uh, on a summer night, for example, you'll see a clear uh, dark patches. So let me show a picture here. Yes, this is the Milky Way, and this is uh, the Milky Way as it is available, uh, visible in the uh, in optical wavelengths, and you can see that there are dark patches, right? And so this is the reason for this. It's APOD uh, is for the astronomy picture of the day. So we every day there are some uh, very interesting pictures, uh, uh, astronomical pictures they show. It's a very uh, interesting website. Anyway, so the reason for the darkness was not very clear initially. It could be that this particular regions are devoid of star for some reason. Or it could be that there is something in the intervening medium that is blocking our view of the background stars, which is why that region is, uh, a, a, a appears to be dark. Now, in 1930, so um, as a... Uh, my question to you, uh, is, I have prepared my talk for physics students, and I have assumed that most of the students are a, um, undergraduate students uh, of physics, because there will be some physics terms, right? So, um, I, I hope that is okay. Yes, sir, it is okay. So, so in 1930, Robert Trumpler did a very interesting experiment. Um, very innovative, very simple. He looked at about 100 what we call open star clusters. These are loosely bound clusters of massive young stars. And he divided them into bins of, according to number of stars. Now, it's uh, reasonable to argue that if star clusters have comparable number of stars, then their intrinsic luminosity and the size would be also be comparable. Then he, so he took these uh, 
sample of uh, star clusters. And then he looked at their angular size in the sky and the apparent, the flux, the apparent brightness. Now, in other words, he was basically looking at two types of distances here. One he called the diameter distance, which uh, I've written it in uh, here. It's basically uh, as D subscript A, basically angular size, uh, the actual size divided by theta. And uh, also the photometric distance or the luminosity distance, DL. And DL square would be the actual luminosity, the intrinsic luminosity, which depends on the number of stars, by the way, divided by four pi flux, the apparent flux. Now, ideally, if, uh, if you plot these two distances, there should be a straight line relation between them. Uh, star cluster would appear to be dimmer if it is uh, farther away, and it also looks smaller. So these two distances should be related. What he noticed was something different. Look at this. There is a deviation from a straight line here, uh, especially for objects which are at a larger distance. And they appear to be dimmer than what you expect. And so, in other words, the photometric distance, the luminosity DL, seems to be larger than, uh, than the diameter distance. In other words, and this can be explained only if there is something in the intervening medium which is blocking our view, which is doing something which is uh, absorbing the light and blocking the starlight and not doing something to the, and do, not doing anything to the size. And it's a very simple experiment, and which is why uh, the, the minimum assumptions involved. So that the conclusions are very firm. So the question is, what can it be? So the flux is dimmed, what is expected from the inverse square law. Now, the question is, what can it be? There are other several observations that tell us that whatever is blocking the view is also scattering light, not just absorbing light. So this is uh, one uh, open cluster. It's a Pleiades. It's a very uh, familiar star cluster in, in, in Indian languages or in Bengali, you call it Kritika. Now, as you can see, if you look away from the stars, um, there is uh, uh, some amount of light, uh, scattered light visible, which is uh, faintly blue. So, uh, and this scattered light is not any line emission, it's continuum. So the spectrum is not uh, due to lines, but uh, so, which means that the scattering is not due to any atoms or molecules, but something else. Uh, something else, since, since uh, the scattered light is faintly blue, so, so you can uh, imagine that the scatterer is larger than atoms and molecules, but small enough. How small? That's the question. So uh, it implies that basically the blue light is being preferentially scattered by some, some tiny objects. Now, one immediate implication is that the star light is going to be rendered redder because the blue light is being scattered away. So the starlight is going to be reddened. Exactly just like what we see during sunset and sunrise. The sun appears to be red because the blue light is uh, scattered away, right? Um, uh, but here in this case, the, the scattering is slightly different from what we see in our atmosphere. The scattering in our atmosphere, we know that the scattering goes, uh, it, it scales as uh, one over lambda to the power four, which is really scattering due to uh, molecules of air molecules. Right? Here, it turns out the, the, the efficiency of scattering, well, I, I would like to use the word extinction, which encompasses both scattering and absorption, which is really taking away the starlight from our view, right? The extinction efficiency, if you plot as a function of wavelength, it turns out to be in the optical infrared regions, roughly one over lambda, not one over lambda to the power four, as you expect from Rayleigh scattering, which we see in atmosphere. Well, how do you know this? How, how did you find that out? Well, we know the intrinsic spectrum of certain stars, for example, the main sequence stars, which we know well, we know their intrinsic uh, spectrum. 
And so when you compare the observed spectrum with the intrinsic spectrum, we can find out what uh, is the absorption or the extinction efficiency as a function of the wavelength. And this is how we find this extinction efficiency. So it's different from the uh, atmospheric Rayleigh scattering, which goes as one over lambda to the power four, which we know to be uh, due to air molecules. Now, this turns out this actually is a very important clue and tells us that the size of the particles which are responsible for scattering and absorption uh, have sizes comparable or slightly smaller than the, the, the wavelength of, say, blue light, a few hundred nanometers. How? So the actual calculation of what um, the, the interaction of uh, dialectic spheres, small dialectic spheres, with the dialectic constant, which is complex, so the imaginary part should take care of the absorption, how these, uh, how tiny dielectric spheres interact with light waves was done by, uh, okay, this is another way of looking at how absorption uh, extinction efficiency uh, falls off at uh, different wavelengths. Uh, if you observe the same region in different wavelengths, for example. Anyway, the extinction is less at longer wavelengths. Now it was done, uh, the actual calculations was done uh, for the, uh, by Gustav B in the 19th century. Um, and. Well, it's not that, you know, we, we don't have any mis scattering in our uh, atmosphere. There is mis scattering uh, because there is dust particles also in our atmosphere. And it is uh, particularly becomes important when you look closer to the sun and the, that uh, mis scattering is uh, uh, the, the, the reason why we see a white glare uh, around the sun. And for that, uh, the, the particle size uh, is, uh, is somewhat comparable, smaller than the lambda uh, wavelength of light, larger than 0.1 lambda. Uh, and so the calculations basically involve a plane wave uh, incident on spherical uh, dielectric spheres. Um, and the, the usual boundary conditions, you have plane wave infinity, continuity across the surface of the sphere, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty involved calculation. We, I don't definitely don't want to get into that. Um, and the scattering, but the result is that the scattering depends on uh, basically the dielectric constant M, which uh, is taken to be complex and, and, um, and the size of the uh, dielectric sphere at the wavelength. Or, the, or in other words, the ratio between A, which is the radius of the sphere, and wavelength. Uh, and this is what we see. Um, so Q is basically, if you take the, the total cross-section, cross-section for scattering, cross-section for absorption, uh, Q is the ratio of the cross-section to the geometrical cross-section, which is pi A squared. And as you can see here, uh, this is as a function of X, X is uh, basically the ratio of A over lambda. And this is Q, Q for scattering, Q for absorption. And as you can see, if it is uh, M, the dielectric constant is only real. Well, then this is what you get for a real M. Um, for very small X or the very, uh, uh, for very small sizes, then you get really scattering. You get a lambda to the power minus four. But if um, for complex M, uh, the absorption coefficient, then absorption, the, as you can see for uh, complex M, absorption becomes important. And if the imaginary part is larger, absorption becomes more and more important. And uh, in, uh, for certain ranges of the particle size, you can actually get uh, a Q absorption to be of the order of uh, scaling as one over lambda, which is what we observe in astronomy. So uh, the upshot is that one can explain the extinction curve by the, the, the observed extinction curve with the help of B scattering theory with particles, which are dielectric spheres basically of uh, with the complex di dielectric constants of uh, a certain uh, size sizes, which are slightly less than say the, uh, uh, the 
the wavelength expect all the sizes to be all the dust grains to be of the same size so there has to be some distribution of sizes and typically um, so x you can do calculations and the typically what we take uh, is a dust distribution so this is n of a uh, means it's a differential uh, distribution uh, number of uh, particles which size between a and a plus da as a function of a in micro and it's log log plot so one has uh, usually one takes a power law distribution and it has been found that if you take a distribution with a power law of about minus 3.5 uh, and with sizes between of uh, particles between say 5 nanometers to about 250 nanometers and that people have worked on variations of that and then one can explain the astronomical observations uh, you might now I must caution you that you know these are theoretical models actual dust particles need not be spheres uh, but in physics you know that we start with simplest models and then we build on the complexity and and in detail uh, in fact the the actual dust particles which have been um, uh, 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 which has been seen by interplanetary in the inter, in our interplanetary space within the solar system uh, are far far from being spherical okay then definitely not spherical but as a starting point uh, one starts with a, a spherical sphere and then you build on and why power of dust distribution the size distribution well that's also not very uh, unreasonable to expect in nature let me give you an example if you take a glass pane of a window pane and drop it and you break into fragments of different sizes there will be distribution of sizes there will be large fragments there will be very small fragments and you'll turn out it will turn out that you will have more smaller fragments than large fragments uh, you know from your experience if you break a glass there are more smaller pieces than large pieces and uh, for example if you take the glass uh, pane and uh, they look at the uh, size distribution, as I just said, uh, in terms of size uh, in log log, you'll get a power law of a different power law index. Here, for example, it's a different experiment. But I wanted to basically say that a power law distribution of sizes is, uh, is to be expected in nature. It's not nothing unnatural. And it turns out so this is what we expect a size distribution of minus 3.5 this seems to be the case in space and the sizes are like this now the next question is what are they made of what, what is the kind of, uh, what is the composition of these grains okay now let's look at this extinction coefficient uh, a coefficient extinction efficiency is a function of uh, lambda i said that it's uh, one roughly one over lambda but there are features there are for example, there are some bumps here, some peaks in certain wavelengths, and they are likely to be clues of, for their chemical composition because they may be uh, they are suspected to be uh, resonances in the molecular bonds. For example, the uh, the, the feature here is uh, likely to be uh, due to graphites. Uh, the feature here is likely to be due to the silicon oxygen uh, molecular bond in silicates. So the idea is that most of the dust particles, a large fraction of the dust particles are basically some form of graphite, some form of silicates. That is the idea. Um, and there have been laboratory experiments also. So this is the extinction efficiency again, but uh, in terms of one over lambda, which is why it's, it looks different uh, rising here. And uh, so this is the feature, this is a bump here. And uh, people have been doing laboratory experiments with the different uh, 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 material, which might give rise to the similar bump. And so that's how uh, one goes on uh, trying to identify what is the dust grain in space they are made of. Uh, and you may have uh, heard of the story, uh, the interesting story of uh, the C60. So there are diffuse uh, interstellar bands, for example, instead of where there are very closely spaced uh, absorption lines, so closely spaced that they, you cannot differentiate from one another. And so they are called bands. And there are many such diffuse interstellar bands. And one of them was identified in 1985 to be due to some form of uh, 
carbon atoms. And it was later realized from Levoter experiments that uh, there are likely to be 60 uh, atoms of carbon uh, forming uh, some sort of a solid. And Harry wrote this paper, and they were all given the uh, he was given the Nobel Prize along with others. Um, I forget when it was given, but anyway, it's an interesting example of something, some material whose existence was first inferred uh, in the interstellar medium as a you know, uh, and then then uh, realized, materialized in the laboratory. And recent uh, observations of uh, Hubble Space Telescope also will confirm that uh, ionized C60 is in, uh, really uh, responsible for these uh, uh, diffuse interstellar bands. Now, C60 is, of course, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a form of molecule, not really dust particle, but uh, this is an example that I thought I would share. Now, going back to dust grains in the interstellar medium, uh, they scatter light, they absorb light, and in the process, they must get heated because of the energy of the that they absorb radiate at a different wavelength. And uh, it turns out to be that they radiate in the infrared wavelength. So for example, this happens uh, uh, in the vicinity of, so which carry a lot of energy. And so when the dust grains in the vicinity of the massive stars, so here's an example of a star forming region where uh, massive young stars are being uh, are there and they, they emit a lot of ultraviolet uh, light and the gas uh, contains dust, gets heated up and then they re-radiated the infrared wavelength, which is uh, observed here, but it's a SOFIA uh, uh, instrument, uh, infrared detector. And the green, I think, corresponds to about 20 microns, and the red corresponds to 30 microns. So, um, so uh, that corresponds to about 100 degree Kelvin temperature. If you look at black body, uh, uh, the Winslow, uh, the temperature and the peak wavelength, which you know from the black body uh, radiation, uh, Planckian spectrum. Uh, actually, one can estimate the temperature of the dust particles very and I, I think you have uh, most of you have done this exercise of uh, estimating the temperature of a planet surface right uh, heated by sunlight um, so you take uh, as a steady state uh, basically which means they it's an energy conservation energy absorbed uh, the amount of energy absorbed is energy being lost right so you say that the the planet has a, a radius uh, capital R so the total energy lost will be at a temperature if it is raised to some temperature t so sigma t to the power four four pi r square this is the total amount of energy that has been lost which must be equal to total energy amount of energy that is being absorbed which is what uh, l solar so in the case of sunlight for example l solar divided by four pi r square there's a flux at the planet's distance and then you multiply by the geometrical cross section which is pi r square um, you also take into account some albedo because not all of it is being absorbed some will be reflected so you take care of the albedo but a similar uh, calculation can be done for massive grains uh, uh, so the dust grains uh, near massive stars so in that case you would take not solar luminosity but the luminosity of the star and the distance of the dust grains from the star and instead of albedo you use the mean scattering uh, the uh, the results of uh, q absorption how much is the absorption efficiency right and you this is exactly the same calculation by the way and you can estimate the temperature and it turns out to be of the order of 100 degrees kelvin and so you expect from black body radiation you expect the re radiated emission to get around 30 micron which is what i had just shown you the picture so things things make sense right uh, so this is the, oh, I mean, this is not really hot uh, in our day to day uh, compared to our daily life experience. It's like minus 170 degrees, but it's hotter than 
the temperature of the molecular cloud in which uh, things are embedded, which is of the order of 10 Kelvin or so. So it is, it is heated up. Um, right, so this is interesting, right? So the dust grains block the starlight, but they reveal themselves in a different wavelength. In other words, let's look at let's uh, look at again the picture of the Milky Way at a different wavelength. I showed you this picture of the Milky Way in visible light, which is full of dark patches. So something was missing from our view of the Milky Way because of these dust grains, which is why we think it's a nuisance, right? But look at the same region, same Milky Way in a different wavelength. So the infrared. This is done. This is a picture from IRAS observations, and I think it's a composition composite picture of. 12 microns, 60 microns, 100 microns. And, uh, and you can see that the dark patches, which were dark, now they're blazing in infrared light. So the dust grains were sitting tight and blocking our view, but if you look at a different wavelength, they reveal themselves, okay? Now, uh, so where do these dust grains fall? And there's the next set of questions. Um, uh, when you compare with the uh, the elemental abundances of the interstellar gas with that of the solar values, you, you find that the abundance of what you call the refractory elements, like aluminium, iron, silicon, they're found to be less in the interstellar space, which, so it makes sense that they're probably being condensing in the form of dust, some condensing away from the gas phase, right? So these elements condense at a, some suitable temperature, uh, 1000 degrees or so, uh, at, and densities and form the core of grains. And they're likely to be surrounded by a mantle of uh, icy, um, ices of different type, water ice, ammonia ice, methane ice. Um, and then astronomers, we think that, you know, they're probably, the, the dust grains probably form in the outer uh, surfaces of, or, or uh, the, what do we call asymptotic giant branch. Well, you know about red giant phase of normal uh, sun-like stars, when at the end uh, stage of when the uh, hydrogen fuel is finished, uh, they swell up sun-like stars and become red giant. And so uh, the stars of other masses also do the similar thing. And then I don't want to get into the detail, but there's something called uh, similar to giant branch. They also go to asymptotic giant branch. Basically, if it is a large stars, they become so large, they, they cannot hold on to their outer surface through gravity. So the outer surface uh, expands. And so when they expand, it cools. And uh, so that provides suitable density, pressure, and temperature for grain formation. So the reflected elements, they condense out in the form of solid grains. It also happens, uh, is likely to happen uh, in the supernova ejecta. Uh, Supernova, as you know, um, the, the end stages of massive stars, and when they eject, uh, they explode, the ejecta expands and cools. So in certain uh, regions, there is enough uh, the suitable conditions for pressure, density, temperature for the formation of dust grains. Um, and dust grains get, get destroyed also. Uh, for example, if you put a dust grain in a very hot medium, say 10 million degrees uh, gas, then the kinetic energy of the particles which are impinging on the dust particle uh, can, uh, can eject electrons, ions, and slowly break it apart. We call it sputtering of grains. Um, it can also happen uh, if the dust grain goes through shock, then the dust grains can get shattered. Uh, so there are different uh, destruction mechanism for dust grains. Um, so in general, the dust grains survive well in cool regions of space. Uh, icy mantles survive for about millions of years, uh, but at the cores, which are more robust, they can survive for about 100 million years or so before they're destroyed in shocks in other regions. Now, one of the most interesting things that the dust grains do is to form molecules. Now, um, I don't have a, uh, what time is that? Um, Okay. How much time do I have? Um, half an hour more or? One minute. Yes, sir, you can do. Okay. 
<laughs> so one of the most interesting things that the dust grains do is to form molecules. Um, and I would like to impress upon you the fact that it is difficult to form molecules in, 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 in interstellar space. Consider the density of the interstellar space. The average density in our galaxy, the space between the stars, the interstellar space, it has a density of about, on average, about an atom per cc. Pardon me for using CGS units. I know uh, all the students uh, uh, used to uh, work on uh, working in MKS, but astronomers use a CGS, but you can convert in your mind. So one atom per cc is the average density of particles in the uh, interstellar medium. If you go to dense clouds, well, you can get up to about 10,000 or maybe 100,000 per particles, particles per cc, but not more than that. This is much smaller than uh, what we encounter in our atmosphere, for example. In an atmosphere, if you use uh, the Avogadro's number, um, the standard pressure and temperature, you'll find that the, the number of molecules per cc is of the order of 10 to the power 19. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's very, very dilute, the interstellar space, and it's difficult to form molecules. Why? Because you have to bring two atoms together for a certain amount of time and, and enough time so that you know you get to release the binding energy. If you don't release the binding energy, you're not going to form the molecules, right? Uh, let's, let's look at that. Uh, let's try to estimate. Now I, bind, I, I bring two atoms together. What is the typical contact time? Well, one can argue that, okay, this is going to be the inverse of the typical vibrational frequency of the molecule that you're going to form of that order. Let's say that's of the order of 10 to the power minus 13 seconds. I need to get rid of the binding energy quickly, right? This is the contact time. How do I release the binding energy? There has to be through photon. So there has to be some transition. Let's look at the transitional probability. The largest transitional probability you can think of is what? Is for Lyman alpha transition in hydrogen atom, that's 10 to the power eight per second. So the inverse time is 10 to the power minus eight seconds. That's the transition time scale, right? Look at this. This is not, this is not enough. The contact time is not enough to release the binding energy in order to form molecules. If you look at this ratio, it's a ratio of about what? 100,000? So that gives a probability of formation of molecules like one in 100,000 collision, such collisions, which are also rare because it's a, such a rarefied situation. The density is so low. So it's next to impossible to form molecules in space. Uh, and this is what where dust grains come in because dust grains provide large surface area in which atoms can get absorbed, stuck to this, and they can combine what happened i'm sorry for this can you see this uh, screen again yes your screen is visible yeah yeah I, i'm sorry for the interruption no, no, so no this is what the uh, dust screens uh, do they provide large surface area in which the uh, atoms can get absorbed and then they can meet combined with other atoms and form molecules. In other words, basically dust green surfaces, they provide a, a dating service kind of thing so that the atoms can combine and form molecules. Let's look at this process in somewhat more detail. I think there's some interesting physics there and uh, with even just BSc physics knowledge, uh, it can become, one can try to understand this. Uh, I, I, and uh, let me show another picture of the same Milky Way that I have been showing in optical and, uh, and infrared. If you look at the distribution of molecules in the Milky Way, uh, this is the distribution of, uh, this is uh, how we know the distribution of molecules. Uh, this is basically CO, I think, uh, carbon monoxide molecules. As you can see, the dark patches which were blocking our view and which were radiating in infrared, those are the places where you see molecules. That gives you a clue that the dust particles are somehow related to the formation of molecules. So let's look at this process of an atom 
coming to a dust uh, uh, grain uh, surface and getting adsorbed. What is the process? Well, uh, there has to be some attractive force. I mean, if the uh, if they're both charged, then there is enough attractive force. But it turns out that even if they're neutral but polarized, and the van der Waal force is enough to uh, for this process. So what happens? The incident atom that comes uh, and but it uh, it has to uh, approach it, it, it approaches uh, the surface. And you can imagine the surface atoms being stuck to the grain by some sort of a spring, right? Now the, the atom approaches and it uh, breaks the charge cloud. So then there is an opposing force. So it bounces back, but it does so before, uh, after uh, imparting the momentum to the surface atoms. And the surface atoms, they vibrate because they're uh, connected like spring. They vibrate and the vibrational uh, energy is given away by a photon. All right, so the incident atom is, is bouncing back, but that not, not enough because the kinetic energy of the incident atom is very small, 10 to the power minus three electron volt if the temperature is of the order of 10K in the gas. And the van der Waals binding uh, energy is by the way, it's larger, it's about 0.1 electron volt. So ultimately the, uh, the atom does some sort of a oscillation and then slowly gets absorbed. And the, the energy, kinetic energy of the incident atom is absorbed by the dust grain and it vibrates and the vibrational energy is given off by, by the photon, right? So you got one atom here, which is sort of stuck to the dust grain, right? Surface, but it's not enough, right? Uh, so here is one uh, dust grain surface and then you've got one atom but uh, well, it has to meet other atoms which are absorbed in some other site. So it has to go, it, it has to hop around, jump around. It's not getting you know, just two atoms sitting on two uh, sites of this uh, as dust grain are going to meet uh, miraculously. So the dust grain, uh, the atom which is stuck to the dust grain jumps around by random walk. How? It gets kicks from the surface atoms, which are always vibrating. So the vibration gives kicks to the incident, uh, the, the atom, and it jumps around, and it does a random walk. Now, the, uh, the typical vibrational energy of surface uh, atoms, it turns out to be of the order of 10 to the power minus three electron volt. Again, I've taken the dust grain uh, energy to be 10 Kelvin, the deep inside molecular clouds. And it turns out that you need about 0 0.01 electron volt to hop to another atom site. Now this is larger, 10 times larger than the average vibrational energy that is given to the, incident, the atom, right? Well, it's an average energy, but this is a distribution. Suppose it's a distribution like Boltzmann distribution type, okay? So because it's thermal, uh, the vibrating because of the, its, uh, its, its temperature, right? So you can assume some sort of a Boltzmann distribution and you can say, ask this question, how likely is it to occasionally get a kick, which is 10 times the average? So, you know, Boltzmann distribution, you can say that, you know, this is going to be of the order of one over E uh, exponential minus E over KT, basically one over E to the power minus 10, 10 times the average. I'm getting kicks all the time but I want to get a kick, which is 10 times the average. What is the probability? This is uh, 10 to the power one, one in 10 to the power four. In other words, I need 10,000 kicks before I get one kick, which is going to take me to another atom, okay? Now, I told you that the dust vibrates with frequency of the order of 10 to the minus 12, minus 13 seconds. So if I multiply by this probability, then, then the time to meet another atom turns out to be of the order of 10 to the minus eight seconds. Remember the binding energy time scale that I told you. We are getting closer here. So there is enough time for the contact between atoms on the dusk in surface. Enough time for me to release the binding energy and form a molecule. 
So the dry skin surface is what it has done by basically providing a large surface area and constantly vibrating because of its own temperature, right? Constantly vibrating. It is giving kicks to the atoms, moving this way, moving that way. And occasionally they will come in contact with other atoms and form molecules, right? So it, so it's, it's uh, uh, in principle, it's possible. And it looks like it is also possible in practice because we see uh, molecules where we see dust grains, just like the picture of Milky Way in molecules I, that I've shown you. Now, it turns out that the molecules are very important for star formation. Consider a interstellar cloud, which is, uh, say, which has been compressed somewhere. I mean, uh, otherwise, uh, interstellar cloud is happy to be in stable uh, condition for a long time. Uh, stable means its, uh, its, its self-gravity is balanced by its internal temperature or maybe some turbulence pressure. It's, it's balanced. But somehow, say, certain part of a cloud is disturbed by some shock passing, passing shock. And so we see, suppose a cloud is collapsing under its own self-gravity. This is how a star is going to form out of this cloud. But there are problems, right? As you know, I mean, if I want to compress, I, I, this gas will get heated up. And once you heat up, its internal pressure is going to resist the in, uh, gravity and it's going to halt the compression. So no luck for star formation if you don't do something to the internal energy. You have to release the internal energy. Continually keep it cool so that you have to ensure that the gas keeps, it doesn't get heated up or it gets cool, right? And how do you do that? By releasing photons. So, uh, and so that, uh, by radiating photons, but it turns out that for that you need molecules if you want to cool below 10,000 degrees. Why? Well, I mean, let's look at this process of cooling a little bit in more detail. What is happening is you have, uh, say, an ion with the different energy levels, and I have electrons here, and it uh, a, a particle, say, an ion or an electron, it uh, collides, and the collision of energy excites the electron to a higher level, right? So this is collisional excitation. And then the electron then de-excites, uh, basically it jumps down to a lower level and radiates a photon. And that's how photon takes away the kinetic energy of the particles, right? So for that, I need to be able to excite the electrons to the higher levels. Let's look at the energy levels of atoms. This is uh, the energy levels of uh, uh, hydrogen, for example, as you know, the typical spacing are of the order of electron volts, of the order of electron volts, which is the average energy of particles at 10,000 degrees. If you just uh, do this calculation, one EV is equal to KT, K being Boltzmann constant, you'll get a temperature of 10,000 degrees, which means when the gas cools below 10,000 degrees, the average energy of the particles is not enough to push the electrons to, to the higher level because the levels are so high of the electron volts, of one electron volt or so. So you need something which has got finer spacing of energy levels because you need to climb to a, because you don't have energy to uh, uh, push it to, a, uh, to electron volt level. And what uh, kind of things can give you finer uh, spacing of energy level? Molecules. Why? Because molecules have more degrees of freedom. They can rotate, they can vibrate, and more degrees of freedom means the energy levels are there are numerous energy levels. So it's likely that there, there will be finer spacing between them. And so even at below 10,000 degrees, the particles can push the electrons to a, a slightly higher level, and the electron can jump down, radiate photon, and cool the gas. And this is a sort of a cooling uh, uh, function, what will be the, the cooling rate of gas as a function of temperature. As you can see, there's a drop at 10,000 degrees. That's because of uh, this particular thing that I told you about. And if you have molecules, only then gas can cool. The, the cooling uh, efficiency uh, depends crucially 
on the abundance of molecules. And so if you have molecules, a gas cloud can continue to cool and become dense at, at certain density. You can expect the thermonuclear reaction to get triggered and you have star formation. So molecules are needed for formation of stars. But we have said that dust is needed for the formation of molecules. So in other words, dust grains are absolutely necessary for the formation of molecules and so star formation. Without dust grains, we don't have, uh, you're not going to form new stars. Now, there's a question, very interesting question that uh, uh, the vice principal asked in the, uh, before I started, that uh, yes, the chemical composition of the gas is changing as the universe is aging because stars produce uh, uh, heavier nuclei, for example, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in their core, and then they uh, explode and they uh, uh, give it back to the gas. So the chemical composition, the average chemical composition of the universe is changing with time. And the question was whether the chemical composition was more suitable in the past for star formation or not. It turns out that it's not. And the question is, the answer is because of dust grains. Dust grains are made of graphites and silicates. Graphite means iron, silicates, uh, 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 carbon and, and, and silicon. Uh, you need silicon, right? Uh, and those elements are produced inside stars. So if you need dust grains to form stars, you need more stars uh, as the stars form, as the universe ages, you have more and more carbon, more and more silicon, more and more dust grains. And so star formation becomes easier with time. It was difficult in the past. So let's think of a, a, a situation where, uh, think of the first stars in the universe. This is a very fascinating topic and it's, there's a lot of research being going on now. For the first stars, we couldn't have had carbon, silicon, oxygen, nitrogen, right? Because it's the first stars. And because at the beginning of the universe, you only had hydrogen and helium from the first three minutes of primordial nucleosynthesis after Big Bang. Only hydrogen and helium. No carbon, no silicon, which means no dust grains. So the whole story that I told you just now breaks down for the question of formation of the first generation of stars. The first generation of stars couldn't have depend on, 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 on dust grains and molecules because there are no molecules. Well, you need molecules in order to form stars, as I just said. So you need to have hydrogen molecules. Helium molecule doesn't exist, right? Hydrogen molecule is difficult because there's no dipole transition, it's a quadruple transition for the binding energy. So, but you have to form hydrogen molecules somehow. Otherwise, you couldn't have had first stars. And without the first stars, you couldn't have the second generation, third generation stars, which would have produced carbon, silicon, et cetera, et cetera, and give you the dust grains to continue with the process of star formation. So the first generation star formation needed to form molecules in the gas phase without the help of dust grains. And that was difficult, which took a long time. And uh, so it took about a billion year or so for the uh, universe and inside uh, the primordial galaxies where uh, in the gas phase hydrogen hydrogen uh, uh, atoms basically formed hydrogen molecule without dust grains and but I, anyway i don't want to get into that because that's a difficult uh, fascinating topic in itself the the formation of the first generation of stars but since this question was asked i thought i would say this so let me go back to the, uh, so this is the story then, there's the cycle of gas and dust. Um, gas uh, uh, contains dust, dust grains form stars, stars uh, then evolve. And then they, as I say, the evolved stars, the surfaces of the evolved stars, the circumstellar uh, region of the evolved stars form dust grains again, 
and or, or the supernova ejector and then that is given back to the star for nebula the interstellar gas and then again you have a star formation so it is a cycle of uh, formation and destruction of uh, dust that goes on um let me ask this question how much dust is there um the dust to gas ratio in the milky way it turns out to be of the order of 120 so in terms of mass then uh, the dust grains don't contribute much just about a percent so this is the sort of a budget uh, uh, if you will uh, of the interstellar gas uh, most of it is hydrogen helium and a little bit one percent in terms of mass is is contributed by dust how do you know this and actually i like to ask my students to always ask me when i whenever i give you the information you should you should ask how do you know this it's not in, just enough to get some information out of google or something we should know how what is the process that gave you this information well this comes from the the uh, studying the extinction efficiency uh, and one way of uh, um, uh, the observations of how much of column density is uh, uh, related to what uh, the extinction so it turns you can express this in this way the mean free path of photons uh, which is, as you know is one over n lambda uh, n sigma sigma is the cross section of area uh, and n is the number of uh, density of particles as you know the mean free path is one over n sigma okay? and the mean free path of photons from observations we know that it's about 1000 light years or so so 1000 light years uh, is the mean free path of photons before it uh, gets absorbed or scattered suppose for the for simplicity we say that all dust grains have one uh, similar size, say 0.5 micron. Okay, and we take the cross section to be uh, geometrical cross section. I mean, disregarding knee theory, which is uh, going to tell you that it's not exactly geometrical cross section. But suppose we do that, then you can get some idea. So you get sigma, sigma is just pi a square. Then you can get some idea of the number density of particles. And then you know that if it is made of graphite and silicates, what is the uh, mass density? So what is the total mass? And that's how we can find out the mass budget of the dust. Now you might think that this is very small, 10 to the power minus 13 per cc. Now compare the, this with the number that I told you, the average density of atoms in space, which is one atom per cc. In other words, you get one dust particle for every 10 to the power 13 atoms, right? You might think that this is very small. Well, I would like you to look at it in a different way. Compare uh, with our atmosphere. It turns out that in our atmosphere, there are roughly one dust particle for every 10 to the power 18 billion, billion molecules okay, in our atmosphere. So, but the density of the atmosphere, as I told you, 10 to the power 19 per cc, whereas the, that of the interstellar media is one per cc. So in the interstellar medium, you have one dust particle for 10 to every 10 to the power 13 atoms. Whereas in our atmosphere, you get one dust particle for every 10 to the power 18 molecules. Which one is smaller? The atmosphere. Another way of looking at it is, if I were to compress the interstellar gas, to the density of our atmosphere, the amount of dust would be 100,000 times than the uh, atmosphere, into the five times. It would be so dusty that if you were to hold your uh, arm, uh, palm at the arm's length, you won't be able to see it. So it's actually a dusty universe. And uh, the uh, interestingly, what people have now been finding uh, is that dust not only is is not only there in uh, galaxy disk of our galaxy but very far away from galaxies also um, even in the relatively empty space between galaxies where the density of typical density of atoms is not one per cc but 10 to the power minus five minus six per cc even there people have found uh, Astronomers have recently found the indication that there is dust particles. Um, it is a very difficult observation. So the conclusions are not very uh, 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 firm yet, but there are strong indications for that. 
But that poses a question. How did the dust reach there? How did it go there to such distant reaches of the universe? All right? It must have been ejected from galaxies because dust couldn't have formed there. It's, it's, it's a very uh, rarefied place, very cold place, and no condition for the formation of dust exists there. So it must have been ejected from galaxies. And this is a question that uh, uh, I'm interested in, and I've been uh, thinking about that. So for example, uh, it could have been blown away from galaxies. Uh, when you have galaxies with vigorous star formation, star formation also produces uh, supernovae because that's the end stages of massive stars. And this is an example of a, a M82 star in, uh, in visible and in infrared and in different other wavelengths people have seen. And you see the gas being ejected out of the galaxy, what we call the galactic outflow. These are large amount of gases being ejected by the energy of uh, the supernova. But it turns out the dust grains are charged. Why? Well, because of uh, the, the ultraviolet uh, radiation from massive stars and, and the photoelectric effect. So the ultraviolet uh, light, they, the photo eject electrons and then make the dust grains charged up to a certain extent. I mean, if it is, uh, it, the positive charge builds to a certain extent beyond which the, the photo ejected photo electron uh, will be brought back. The work function becomes larger. Anyway, so dust grains are positively charged usually. And you have plasma, the gas is also hot. So the dust grains are actually coupled to the gas by simple Coulomb interactions, just like you know, electrons and ions are coupled in the plasma. And so the dust grains can be ejected along with the gas. It can also happen, the dust grains, because they provide some sort of a bigger surface, the cross-sectional area that they offer to light is much more than Thomson cross-section, for example, for electrons, because dust grains are large. And so radiation pressure becomes important. And radiation pressure can push dust grains away. And as the dust grains move, they also pull along the gas. So these are all uh, 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 connected processes. And uh, I have been interested in this process. And this is a, 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 a result of simulation that I have done with my collaborator. This is done with Indranil Chattopadhyay, who is in Aries, Nainital, and my uh, former student, Mahavir Sharma and Dong Si Ryu in Korea. So we, what we try to do is to look at how the radiation pressure from galaxy, the, the light that is coming out of uh, stars in the galaxy, how that can impart momentum to the dust particles and that can lift out of the so as if uh, this is a basically time snapshots. This is uh, uh, so slowly gas and dust is lifted out of the disk and can be ejected away. Now it's a very simple uh, uh, um, uh, simulation setup that I did. This is like 10 years ago, uh, but there are questions that remains and that I'm interested in. For example, in this process, what is the, uh, survival, uh, uh, the, the question of survival during the transport. Is it true that the smaller grains are going to be destroyed because it, it, the, the gas is hot? So remember the sputtering of grains that I told you. But I, I think the smaller grains are likely to be destroyed. And if so, is that true when you find what you find in the clusters of galaxy or uh, intergalactic medium? Uh, is that uh, what you find? So these questions are uh, important. And uh, well, the, the research on dust grains in the universe, in galaxies, has become uh, more interesting because of new probes have come up. And you know about ALMA, this is, uh, this is in Chile, the Atacama uh, uh, Desert in Chile. Um, and as you know about JWST, which is going to be launched soon within this month, which is going to have uh, infrared detectors um, and earlier, previous to that, uh, there were uh, Spitzer telescope, Herschel telescope, space, space, space telescope. So infrared observations have become uh, very important in astronomical uh, research. Let me just have a one slide. Uh, I thought this is also going to be interesting. I, I talked about the formation of molecules. And it turns out that there are many complex organic molecules, like the prebiotic molecules, which have been discovered in, in the interstellar space. And, uh, it's, it's likely that they have formed on the dust grains. 
this is many, many, uh, there's some examples of the complex uh, uh, organic molecules. Um, it's a whole subject out there. Uh, and I'm not an expert in that, the formation of, uh, but it's very interesting that it's possible that, you know, uh, after the star formation, these molecules may be delivered to the planets by comets, asteroids, because these complex molecules have been found in the comets in our backyard. Uh, for example, glycine, it's uh, the, one of the amino acids, is, is uh, the simplest amino acid, but it's an amino acid. It's a complex organic molecule has been found in, 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 uh, in a comet. So it's, uh, it's not impossible that the dust grains um, in hold a uh, clue to the emergence of life elsewhere, maybe on Earth even. So that's where I would like to stop. And uh, so what I've tried to do is to, to convey that although the dust grains in the interstellar space may not amount to much in terms of mass, they're very crucial for the processes that uh, uh, make galaxies evolve, like formation of stars. Uh, and the study of dust grains um, is very important in order to understand the evolution of galaxies, and that of the universe, uh, and maybe even the emergence of light, life. And I've also tried to uh, uh, talk about how, what is the process of how dust can lift, uh, get lifted out of the galaxy and get uh, and reach the distant corners of the universe and make it a very dusty universe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Joy, please uh, conduct the question answer yeah. session. Okay, so uh, I think there are two questions that I think uh, already sort of answered. Uh, uh, those questions are in the chat box. Okay. Let me see. Uh, uh, from Onupam, uh, is the scattering very less in me scattering? Uh, sir, uh, you can also see the chat box. Uh. I, I don't understand what you mean by less or uh, less less than what? So, Anupam, uh, can you be specific? Uh, Anupam, please unmute yourself and talk. It's uh, well, like uh, at... rally scattering. No, no, no. See, if you look at the absorption, uh, the coefficient uh, efficiency, the Q, um, let me get back to that. Right. Can you see my screen? So here, this is in terms of the geometrical cross section pi a square. Uh, right? Sir, uh, uh, I guess the uh, screen is oh, not oh, visible. Oh, right. yeah. 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 Yeah, now it's fine. Right. So, um, uh, by the way, this oscillations uh, they come um, because of interference from different. Uh, you know, it's you're talking about a, a solid object here, and so there are wavy patterns here. Uh, it's definitely not less. This is in terms of. Look at. I, I'll ask you a very interesting question. Look at a very large asymptote. It's of the order of two, which means the total extinction cross-section compared to the geometrical cross-section is a factor of two. Twice the geometrical area. Certainly not less, okay? Um, and uh, well, I'm, that's a separate question in itself. And you might want to think about it. Why is it two? It comes from Babinet principle. So the, uh, the answer to your question is definitely not less. I mean, as you can see, it's uh, because of me scattering, it, it's offering a cross-section which is double the area of its own just geometrical cross-section. Right? What are the other questions? I... How did the dust grains form at the first place if they themselves act uh, like a kind of catalyst to form other molecules? Yes. Yeah, it's a, so 
So as I told you, in the very beginning, there were not much of carbon and silicon uh, uh, atoms. So, so it needed, so the, the first uh, stars were formed without the help of uh, dust grains. So, but once the first phase of star formation uh, uh, were over, there were enough uh, uh, carbon and silicon in the universe to be able to form dust grains. It's only the you know, first uh, phase that was uh, that is problematic here. Is that what you mean? Yes, sir. Thank you. I understood. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? Junik uh, Shengupta raised hand. I think. Junik. Yes, uh, do you do you want Junik. to? Junik. Uh, Junik, you can Hello. go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, first of all, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, myself, Juni Singapore. I'm a pass out 2021 from University of Calcutta. Uh, sir, I actually have two questions. The first one is, how does dark dust particles interact with dark matter? Uh, Whoa. Well, I don't know. I don't even know what dark matter is. I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> so if we ever find out, take dark matter and when we know what uh, that material is, or what that are, you know, then probably we'll be able to answer this question. But before that, I don't even know where to start. Okay, uh, so am I allowed to ask a second question? Yeah, yes, yes, you can. Yeah. Okay, uh, sir, the second question is that, uh, is it possible for these dust particles to gain sufficient amount of energy and while they collide among each other to result in the formation of tiny black holes of absolute lower mass as compared to our regular ones? Whoa. Well, I mean, I've given you the um, typical um, sizes. And if you look at the density of the largest size is about 0.5 micron, right, in, in the interstellar space. And then if you want to bring in two dust grains and form black holes, Find it a very unlikely process. I mean, I I don't know. Uh, first of all, why one why would one think about that? Okay, uh, sir. Because uh, recently, actually, I was been right. working. Yeah, on, yeah. Actually, I was been working on primordial black holes. There are possible ways of formation and how could they uh, collide or they collapse. Uh, and in comparison to this, I asked uh, someone, uh, uh, sir, Professor Gerard T. Hoof, that uh, what are the possible ways of uh, formation of this primordial black okay. holes. So he answered that uh, it, it's possible for particles to gain sufficient amount of energy higher than the Planck scale and collide and result in the formation of primordial black holes. So is it possible for this dust? Yeah, I, I find it very unlikely that this is going to happen to dust grains. You need very high energies. Okay. And the dust particles say, recording in progress. Just in the thermal pool of the interstellar gas, the, the thermal energy is not enough. That's my hunch. You probably need fundamental particles with very high energies in order to do that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, I yeah. Uh, I guess uh, there are no other questions. I'm not. No one is raising hand. Then so, uh, Joytadi, uh, you can conclude. Yes. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much for giving us your valuable time. So um, we'd like to hear from you in future also. Thank you very much for inviting me again. Yes, I. You would have been great. I would really like to. Uh, okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you so much.